it's a some form of, of, of politics. His great gift, one might say, politically, was his ability to turn ideas into very popular notions. I mean, why did he enrapture audiences in the beer kellers of Munich and southern Germany after 1919? He had a, a, a knack, a gift, call it what you will, for turning quite tricky, difficult ideas into uh, popular expressions that could be uh, latched onto, and you could get a yes or no answer to them. And he became very uh, fond of the rhetorical question, do you want to live in this condition forever? Is Germany, does Germany really deserve this fate? And the answer was always yes or no in a very straight sense. So his ability to simplify really quite complex notions is one of his great malign gifts that he developed uh, post-war. Fascinatingly, he was unaware until then of the gift that he had. I mean, all the records suggest pre-1918, he couldn't make friends, he couldn't make contact. Um, he was never thought of as leadership quality. I mean, for four years he serves as a soldier and never rises above private. Another little myth you might throw away in your um, trivial pursuit questions. Um, he was never a corporal. Um, you often hear and read he was Corporal Hitler. He never rose, he was never elevated to that rank. He was private first class, that's as far as he got. He made no attempt to be promoted. Um, he had no design, desire for promotion. And the misty picture we have is that he was always in the background, never, never pushing himself. Um, there are accounts of him in the 1418 period as a member of the List Regiment, named after General List, who organised the regiment. Um, uh, and he is a very minor figure. Um, I've said li that he was literally a, a shady figure because the photographs we have of him are shady, they're poorly focused. So both as a thinker, as a political uh, animal, and as a being, he is shady, 1418. Nothing to suggest the qualities that he will later develop. And he did say, of course, he found in himself a capacity for public speaking he didn't realise he had. And he used it to brilliant effect. And um, whatever one might say about the results of what he does, um, as um, a populist politician, He's unmatched, I would say, in the 20th century. Um, he sets a pattern, he sets a, a model of how to, to get across to people who, with a sense of grievance. <coughs> That's a great art of the populist, isn't it? To be able to play upon grievance, to be able to, to nurse, or to allow us to nurse their grievances, and you become the expression of them. And that's, that's his great gift. Um, I, I mentioned the emigres who, uh, with whom we had contact. Um, they had come across, as I say, from Bolshevik Russia. They brought with them this intense distaste, rejection of Bolshevism, which they identified with Jewry, with the, the Jewish plot. And he accepted that. Um, if you read his writings and speeches of the early period, they mirror in a very close way those of uh, someone called Dietrich Eckhart, who was the main link between him and the emigres, a Baltic German, but who had studied and trained and fought in, in Russia and, and was fluent in, in Russian. And Eckhart gave him a lot of the language which we identify in Mein Kampf, for example, came from Eckhart. Uh, so he, he was deeply, he was very susceptible, deeply impressionable, and he was impressed by, by the emigres and by their interpretation of what had happened in 1917. Well, it was simply a Russian story, that, they said. It was a story of international jury on the march, choosing Petrograd as their first point. But their task, as, as Jewish corruptors of, of civil society, their, their task was to affect the whole of Europe. It began in, in Russia. Very different notion from the one that the standard received you now. But that's what he took to, that's what he accepted and worked on from that point. Um, so the impact of the Russian Revolution is something we now give great weight to in studying Hitler. It made a big impact in the negative sense, but it made a big impact. Um, and Brigitte Harman has written a fascinating book on, on his pre-1914 and post-1914 period, up to the time when he became conscious of the Russian Revolution. Um, the book, if you're interested, it's in the list, but Michael Kellogg, a couple of years back, wrote a fascinating study of the impact of the emigre Russians uh, in Europe, uh, particularly, of course, on, on the Nazis and specifically on, on Hitler. And that's probably the best lead in, if you're interested in that theme, the way um, white Russians impose their notion of what 1917 had been about 
upon uh, Hitler and upon the nascent uh, uh, Nazi party. Well, our second theme, as we've suggested there, is left or right. I put that in because uh, later in the Nazi story, there were great efforts made on the part of the propagandists, Goebbels, of course, leading the way, to explain away any of the oddities about uh, Hitler's career post-1918. And one of the things that embarrassed the Nazis was that he had led towards communism. He was called by some of his contacts a red. Adolf the Red became a common name in 1919. Now why? Because, as this rather bewildered individual, 30 years old nearly, um, when he saw the uh, turmoil in Germany post-1918, what he was very conscious of was the need for some power to impose itself. There's an interesting line of connection between people like Mao and Stalin and Hitler. In, in, they, they love the expression of power. They love the, the workings of power. Um, they're deeply moved by the idea that power actually works. That ideas are fine, but do you have the means to control, to impose, to structure? And if you've made a, a, a brief reference, you could say that those three individuals have that fascination with this structure of power. And Hitler, one can identify here, as being deeply impressed by power. When it worked, he was fascinated. Why does it work? What is power? Ask them that in a hundred different ways. But, but it's the imposition of one set of values or ideas upon those who don't accept them. That's his starting point. And he, in 1921, 2021, as now, by now leader of this young party, his notion is that you, you, you don't need to argue the case in terms of the theology of the party. What you need is to put across very simple, basic ideas and hammer them home in such a way they excite reaction, even resistance. doesn't matter. Your task as a young party, told his it, fellow Nazis, is to impress, is to impose yourself upon your circumstances, upon your environment, upon your circumstances. Whatever they might say about your ideas, they might reject them. It doesn't matter. You've got to force your way forward. That's what great leaders do. He went back to Frederick the Great and said, well, how did Frederick achieve what he did? Power. Use of power. Recognition of the means and the technique of power use. Power structure. Um, and that is the driving element that, that uh, identifies him um, in, in the early years of, of Nazism. Um, there is a speculation that's worth pursuing for a moment that had the Reds, the Communists, actually succeeded in Munich in 1919. You know, they, there's, a, there's a coup, there's a, there's a grab of power. And for some four weeks, there's a Red Soviet in Munich, with which Hitler, as an army representative, liaises. And all the records suggest he was very impressed by the Munich Soviet, until it started to collapse. And then, going on his basic idea of where does power lie, he then very quickly withdraws his support and looks for some other means to express this power drive. And that, that of course, is, is what becomes the Nazi party. But initially, in 1919, he was deeply impressed by the Reds because he thought that much as he hated 1917 and its outcome as a Jewish triumph in the Bolshevik Revolution, he saw that it, it did work. Power was working. If the Munich Soviet was going to work, he wanted to be on the side of it. Now, later, of course, that looked deeply embarrassing. For Hitler to have been a pro-communist at any point in his career would be take some explaining away. And so, of course, the Nazi propaganda machine made a great point of suppressing all the evidence in that regard. Anybody likely to spread that idea was arrested under the Nazi regime. They just couldn't tolerate that. But the evidence does suggest that he was impressed, certainly for some weeks, if not months, by the Munich Soviet, that communism in practice was working, and therefore it might be worth belonging to. Extraordinary, when we look back. Of course, it fails, it fails in, in a bloodbath, and he very quickly withdraws, tries to cover all his tracks, and then looks, as it were, for some other means to express his politics. And of course, the party then becomes, that, that young German workers' party, becomes the mean through which he can express this. Uh, so there's left or right. Um